Well, there's a little saying, a little quip that I like to make. History is written by the winners. Okay. All right, yes it is. So the wonderful history of Citadel is how we're the most profitable hedge fund of all time. Yeah. The chapter of how we were, we were on the verge of going out of business in 08 is now like a footnote in that book. Mm. All right, and that's, a, that's a very important note. It is not all. Been, it has not all been an easy march to success. It's it's had, you know. I, I think I have the uh, the interesting position in life. I've probably lost. My team has probably lost more money than perhaps any other firm in existence. We just happen to have made more money <laughs> <laughs> than almost any other firm in existence. Yeah, yeah. And it's the net yeah, yeah, yeah. that everyone talks about. I mean, there's years where our losses are, are hundreds of billions of dollars. Wow. Okay? I, I don't know if it's hundreds. It's over 100, maybe hundreds. It's, it's numbers are Big. incomprehensible, okay. right? Yeah. So number one is all my losses are my tuition. I have the most expensive education in American history. <laughs> and a number of my colleagues have educations that are becoming competitively expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, and it, it, I think it's very important that, like, we, I, I, in some sense, you have to have be held, you have to have a moment of levity. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. like if if every time you lost money, you you just got depressed and angry and you couldn't deal with it, you'd just have a very short career. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to take a step back and go, it's a tuition bill I paid. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't mean that you don't think very long and hard about what went wrong, but you have to keep it in perspective, right? In 08, that tuition bill almost became getting expelled from school because we, were, we, we lost half of our equity in 16 weeks in a firm that had never had a double-digit drawdown in 20 years. The only reason we survived and there's a number of reasons, but the principal reason we survived is that when long-term capital failed in 1998, I went and met with a number of the senior people that worked at long-term capital. Why did I do this? What was my agenda? I wanted to understand how does a firm that loses 90% of its equity in a levered financial services industry still stay in business? Like, if you ask me, that's one of the greatest accomplishments of all time, yeah. was that they lost 90% of their equity mm -hmm. before they lost control of their business in a financial services, in a, in a levered financial services company. And, and much of what we learned from how they survived that was actually fundamentally, existentially important to our ability to withstand the turmoil of 2008. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a very important lesson here, which is, not only do you want to learn from your mistakes, you really want to learn from the other people's guys. mistakes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're much yeah. cheaper tuition bills. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So, you know, I've spent over my lifetime a lot of time at the proverbial scene of accidents where other firms have gone awry. Mm -hmm. When Enron filed for bankruptcy, you guys even know what Enron is practically. Yeah. That's a, I'm dating myself here. <laughs> Enron was the largest energy trading firm in the United States, and they blew apart in a spectacular way in roughly 2001. The day they filed for bankruptcy, I chartered a Gulfstream jet, put 16 people on the Houston, and all we did was interview people at Enron hmm. for several days. What worked, what didn't work, how they made money, how they ran the business, what the competitive advantages were. Now, the great part about this story, I hired the entire leadership of the quantitative research effort at Enron. All the guys, all the people that knew how the place worked. UBS bought the business, except for the research team. Mm -hmm. We've made, I don't know, $30 billion in commodities since then, and UBS shut the business down. Mm -hmm. All right? That's about being on the ground. Yes. That's about understanding where the business actually created value. That's about extracting the right people from that moment in time. Mm -hmm and surrounding them then over the years to come with the right leadership team, the right investment professionals, the right software engineers in building what is today one of the most important commodities businesses in the world. Mm. So going back to our 08 experience, the first 
point is when you are when you are walking through hell just put one foot in front of the other just keep going and literally i was just praying that we would find our way out of that fire why don't i use this fire analogy i, I called lloyd blankfein who ran goldman sachs at the time and i said lloyd like when is this going to end and he goes a forest fire ends when there's nothing left to burn. <laughs> I'm like, this isn't making me feel any better. <laughs> All right? But we never gave up during that period of time. And by we, it really was the entire leadership team. Mm -hmm. Number two, think about who around you is in, a, is in a functional state of mind in a moment like that. Mm -hmm. Some people in a crisis like that cease to function. Other people shine. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're pushing decision making to those who are mentally in the game in the right way. Because some people just, it's their first adversity. It's like the proverbial deer in the headlights. Yeah. Right? And, and to be clear, there were days in 08 that I felt a bit like the deer in the headlights. And I was really fortunate to have partners around me for whom those were good days with good decisions. And we would change roles over the period of that 16 weeks. So this is where. Who you've surrounded yourself really matters. Because when you surround yourself with the right team, you will buttress each other on your darkest days in a really important way.